From the Hype HQ studio in Chicago, Illinois, it's Startup Hype Man, the podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Raj Nation, and I am the founder of Startup Hype Man. Fast-growing startups work with me because they want to become better storytellers. Whether that's for customers, investors, or a packed audience, they know that story is their ticket to stand out, stand apart, and change the game. And this podcast here is where I talk with entrepreneurs and leaders in the startup ecosystem, ranging from scale stage to early stage, as they share specific strategies that they have executed to stand out across three specific areas, sales, marketing, and people. Before we begin today's episode, remember you can head to startuphypeman.com and subscribe to the newsletter that doesn't suck. You'll get new podcast episodes and timely reads written by me, but also helpful articles from around the web and a notice of upcoming pitch competitions. All right, let's dive in and hear how today's guest is changing the game. Ladies and gentlemen, making her way to the microphone from Columbus, Indiana, and currently residing in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She is the co-founder and CEO of MomHive. Please welcome Alyssa Cairns. Hi, thank you for the intro. Alyssa Cairns, welcome to Startup Hype Man, the podcast. She, as I said, is the co-founder and CEO of MomHive. What is MomHive? It is the first all-female co-working space with, importantly, on-site childcare in Western Michigan. I have to believe one of the first in the U.S. as a whole. They have been around for eight months, and in their first two months of operations, they sold out of the childcare program. There, it's been, and I think that's reflected in how their members have succeeded. Some of their members have been able to 4x their company size in that time. Today, we're talking with Alyssa about a topic that I don't think we've ever touched on on this show, and it's going to be a great conversation. It is balancing your message with your mission. Alyssa, welcome to the show, and let our listeners know why that topic is important to you and why it's on your mind. Yeah, I um, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, it's a treat. We, since opening, um, you know, you, you start a business thinking you're going to do one thing, and you learn about your audience, and you learn about the market as you go. Um, we opened with remission just to support and create a resource for working moms who were struggling to balance working from home and being primary caregivers for their for their little ones right um it's an extremely overwhelming space to be in and um you know we started by addressing that population and then you know, i'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about this but um, we really realized that we were addressing something much bigger. So it's really, uh, it's been a journey in staying true to the way we started, but then tackling you know, bigger societal issues as we go. I'm really excited to talk all about that. Before we do, let's kind of learn a little bit more about you, the person. Now, interestingly enough, your background is in higher education. Um, you came out of college, you've worked at City Colleges of Chicago, um, you have had multiple roles, like you were a college advisor, a Truman. So how, I guess, what was your plan when you were in undergrad? And how do you feel working in academia or in the higher education landscape? What mm -hmm. do you feel it taught you? Sure. I, you know, and I always kind of joke that like growing up, I didn't know what I wanted to be. Um, but I've always tried to be good at whatever I was doing. So I think I landed in higher ed because I was really good at being a student hmm. and I was really good at um, creating intentional spaces. I was an orientation leader. I was in Greek life. Um, you know, like being a leader of communities was always inspiring. I considered being a youth pastor at one point for the very same reason, right? I loved going on mission trips. I loved um, creating spaces where people could come together, um, and so I went into higher ed thinking like, oh, I'll just be an orientation leader for the rest of my life. Like, <laughs> I love college students. I love helping people be successful. Yeah. Um, and then I went to Loyola University in Chicago, got into social justice education and really had a heart for helping uh, disenfranchised, you know, inner city community college students. Yeah. I love everything about that public education system. Um, but trying to balance that life with being a mom 
was difficult. Yeah. And it, so, uh, yeah, that's part of how I ended up here. <laughs> well, so at least as I understand it, you go from higher education into being a home improvement and design consultant. Yeah. Uh, is that is is that partially because more flexible schedule, and then also like, but like, how how does one become a home improvement and design consultant? Well, so I'm literally the statistic of women who, um, you know, it's a crazy number, like 98% of women who are professionals do not plan on leaving their careers after having children. Of those who didn't plan on leaving, 43% or more off-ramp in the first few years of being a mother because it's too much. Um, so I am an off-ramper. When it came time to expand my family, you know, my husband and I said, we can't keep living downtown Chicago, two careers. I can't figure out how to add another child to this family. Um, and so the solution was to move closer to family in Michigan. Um, I left my full-time career in education because I wasn't going to get the maternity leave and the time with my kids that I wanted. And so I started an online business. Uh, in interior design because I love real estate. I love design. My husband and I flip properties and I was like, well, I, I need to get paid for something. I didn't intend on being a stay at home mom. That wasn't the goal. Like um, I just couldn't figure out how to work full time in my industry and be the present parent that I wanted to be. So I'm starting so to the, see the design comments. business. Yeah. <laughs> the design business was like, was a, a side effect of parenthood kind of forcing me out of my career. Sure. Sure. And I'm sure you took something you were naturally good at and then you figured out yeah. how to monetize it. Yeah. Yep. It now, was like a fun side hustle. Yeah. Well, I'm starting to see some elements come together here for mom hive because, well, obviously you're a mom, but then on top of that, in working in higher education, you basically figured out how to herd cats. <laughs> uh, yeah. On top of that, you then do this design consultant, which is, well, if you're going to open a co-working space, you better know what it should look like, right? And then I yeah, think, intentional. Mm -hmm. and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, while you're this design consultant, you probably ran into an issue of working from home and not being as efficient as you want it to be. Absolutely. Like, so I, I do like to say that I uniquely have, I've lived every version of being a working mom, right? I worked in an office. Um, I've worked from home. I've tried to start my own business. Uh, my husband is also a remote worker. And so, um, you know, we've worked through all the goods and bads of working from home. Um, so I think like to, to take that back to mom, I'd like when it came time we literally created a solution to something that I was feeling very acutely. Um, I reached out as the mom community often does on Facebook and I reached out to my organic network and said, I'm trying to grow a business to support my family. My son is almost in preschool. Like, what do you do? How do, how do the rest of you work from home with kids? And like this just massive chorus of women saying, there's outpouring the struggles that they were all going through. Um, everything from isolated, overwhelmed, can't focus, um, you know, working all the time, but never getting anything done. Right. So like all of a sudden I wasn't alone. I wasn't the only one. Um, and for me as a problem solver and someone who likes to take care of people and fix things, you know, it was an immediate like um, feeling of obligation. Like, I need to fix this because it's not just for me. Um, it's for all of us. So um, that's, that's where we found the, the first community that needed this. And literally after meeting my co-founder, Kelly Palm, we said, what do we need to do to get it off the ground? Like, these women need it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny because a lot of people who are used to working in office settings are often like, oh, I wish they would just let us work from home. And then like, once you start working from home, you're like, oh, I wish I could just work in an office. <laughs> I got to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt, you know, I felt that too. I, I, I ran Startup Hype Man out of a home office for a couple of years uh, before moving out. And I cannot tell you the difference in productivity, productivity and efficiency being out of the home office now. Right. And I, I think like having a, just a different space to go to, 
Um, and, and statistically or societally, it's different for women than men. Um, yeah, of course. And, and the different roles that you play in your household. You know, my husband works from home. He's not distracted by the laundry. Um, huh. He can be very productive at home and he likes it because he has more freedom of time, less commute, you know, less distraction. For me, it, um, and what I hear from a lot of the moms that work here is that being home is a full-time job already on its own. Like, you know, if you are the house manager and the primary parent in your family, adding more work to that space just doesn't help you. Yeah. Um, I will say though, when we opened, we thought we would be serving those freelance business owner, small businesses. And what we have landed in, and this is where like the mission and the messaging kind of has evolved and turned into something bigger and different is that um, we're actually supporting women who work in remote careers, right? They have an employer and they work from home and they still manage that same stress um, as business owners. Um, but they have to like clock in and put in 40 hours because sure. they have another boss who's not themselves. Um, we're also supporting women who are working locally, but maybe need a flexible space one or two times a week. And um, what's happened is that Mom Hive has become part of the local conversation of how to best support women in their careers through parenthood. Like, how can we create a, you know, a workforce where parenthood isn't the thing that kicks out all this valuable talent? Okay, so I think this is probably the right point then to really focus in on this topic of balancing your, mis your, your message with your mission. So let's take your first batch of customers. And, you know, you're eight months in, so pretty much everyone at this point is still, quote unquote, the first batch. But what did you find your customers were initially coming to mom hive for? Was it like, I just need to put my kids somewhere. Was it, I need to get out of the house. Like what was that key message that resonated with them off the bat? Um, the, on a very surface level, it is, I need somewhere to go. That's not home. Mm. Um, and in creating a somewhere to go, that was intentionally, supporting other women um, we've we, you know one of the biggest pain points is that you're isolated when you work from home with kids like your kids are great but they're really not that great to talk to all day and they can't <laughs> help <laughs> I mean they can't help you with e email marketing right like, yeah. <laughs> they're actually not very valuable hey, there's a chimp on this <laughs> it, right hey look can I push all these buttons no <laughs> you can't um, and so they're delightful. None of us are saying we don't love being, you know, moms. Like there's yeah. a reason women are, are working from home. There's a reason they're home with their kids. Um, and again, I'm talking about our, our business owner, our freelancer um, population. Um, but they've been in, working in isolation, some of them for years and growing businesses in little stolen nap times and mm. after bed. And, you know, now we said we have childcare four hours a day and we have a space with Wi-Fi and really good coffee and peace and quiet where you can get shit done. Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, I'm in, take my money. Like there is nothing like this that's been created for specifically for working moms. Sure. Um, and anywhere around here. So that initially just having the space. And we talk about space of like physical space and space as in like space in your day, like time. And so by creating those two things, um, that's the first take my money. Like, yeah. Um, so it very much is the, like the immediate, like lowest hanging fruit of lowest the, the most hanging. obvious pain point, right? Yeah. Like that acute pain point of I need to get out of my house and I need my kids away from me just for a minute because I also have something else that I want to get done and I can't do it when I'm home with them all the time. Yeah. Um, so that was the very first one that those were the, you know, the hands jumping up and down saying like, I'm in whenever you get this going. What we didn't expect, but also happened 
kind of right there at the beginning were remote workers. So women who have positions in tech, uh, project managers, designers, who don't own their own business, right? Like they're an employee, they just work remotely. And a lot of them had tried other co-working spaces in town, but investing in full-time childcare and investing in a co-working space membership, yeah. you know, it's it like a net loss play. at that point. It is. And if you, if you look at some of the data, one of the reasons that women leave their careers is that it's almost more financially responsible to stay home than it is to keep working and pay for childcare. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The actually, I know someone who it's <laughs> happened to. Yeah. Yep. So the cost of childcare, depending on where you live, it, it doesn't feel like we have a choice um, between parenthood and, and a career. So we have women who actually came from other co-working spaces and reduced the amount of childcare that they pay for the week. And so the days that they're here, they bring their kids here ah. and then they spend the afternoon home so they can get the rest of their work day in nap time, you know, or whatever in the evening, but it's enough to create the balance that they want, they wanted as yeah. a professional mom um, and kind of combines two of those resources that were a financial drain. Yeah. Well, so all this comes from that, like we said, like that low hanging fruit of the, the obvious pain point that they were feeling that you're speaking yeah. to now. Are you, are, is this coming across in one-to-one -one conversations or like is your website also putting this message that we just talked about, like that low hanging fruit message out there? Like, how, you know, like how, how are people actually getting to mom hive in the first place? Um, if you search co-working space Grand Rapids, we're on number one Google search. So if they're looking for a space, they can find us. Um, but we also have been featured in a lot of local media, um, and Facebook and word of mouth is very, is very powerful. Okay. So, um, we do have a lot of referrals and a lot of, you know, people hear about us and they stop by for a tour the next day. Well, you mentioned kind of at the beginning that it's, a there's this like pretty supportive mom community. So I, I would imagine word of mouth almost more than any other industry is, yep. is one of the strongest levers. It, absolutely, especially in um, you know a smaller city like this, those those organic networks are very strong. Um, you know, we have a Facebook group of over 500 working moms, mm. so I have 35 members, but you know I've got a direct line to like the working mom yeah. community, and it, it keeps growing as people find out that we're here. Of course, of course. So, with that said, you talked about you're out in the media and things like that. Now, in the interviews you've been in, are you sticking to that low hanging fruit message or then do you touch on the larger, actually, let's start here. Let's first get an idea of what is the larger mission of Mom. There we go. Yeah. So uh, our mission is to improve the, uh, the success of women in their professional careers and prevent them from dropping out of the workforce because they're now parents. Um, and we took, you know, our mission statement is that we support the professional success of women through every chapter of motherhood. If you want to dig that deeper and unpack it, it means that we want to help women not feel that they have to fall out of the workforce and you know, help support them in whatever type of career they pursue so that they're still working when their kids are in high school. Um, you know, if you want to look at gender wage gap and, and glass ceiling concepts. Let's look at it. So, right, let's look at it. So much talent, so much qualified talent falls out of the workforce because people like me feel as if they don't have a choice between having a family and continuing in your career. And so I stay home, say I'm home for 12 years. By the time my second or third kid is full-time in school, what does it look like on my resume when I try to come back into the workforce and say, oh, I have a master's degree from 20 years ago. Mm. 
oh, I was at three promotions in three years, 17 years ago. Yeah. How does that translate? And how do I convince an employer not to discriminate against the gap on my resume just because I had a family to raise? And, and societally, that. that's not equally important yet. Right, right. And not only how do they not discriminate against the, the resume gap, but if they don't and they do hire, how do they not discriminate saying, well, why should we pay you as much if you had 17, a 17 year break? Right. I'm sure that, right. that, that's, that's like the second part of it is if right. they do say yes, how do you, how do you prove your value if you've had right. this long break? Right. I feel, or I'm, I mean, they're perceived to be, or I feel, or in, in, in tech fields, I may very well be irrelevant, right? I'm off track. I'm behind. I'm not plugged in anymore. Um, I'm not as valuable as I would have been. And I can never make up for that exponential lack of hours on my job as my male counterpart. Right. Because, yeah, because they're right? still working. Because they kept up, working. Keep working. Yeah. I ran the household. They got to keep working. And when I want to come back, I don't get interviewed for the VP position. Mm-hmm. Just because I'm, I'm not qualified yet. I would have to work 17 more years, so I'll never be the CEO because I'm never going to be that old. Right. <laughs> like, I don't want to work until I'm 80. Right. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about, like, making sure there's enough women on your board of directors or how many Fortune 500 companies have female leadership, well, how many women didn't even get to sit at that table because they're home raising your kids? Right. Right. I so think we're, we're never going to have equality of, of talent or of representation and leadership until we can figure out a way for the workforce to support men and women through all of these life experiences. Um, we can't only promote the people who can put their job first all the time. Forbes put out a report last fall mm-hmm. of the 100 most innovative leaders in the U.S. And I think it had one maybe two women on it which naturally and rightfully so caused a major uproar you know i wrote an article about it but like i really i looked into like the data behind it you know because i I didn't want to just have like the flippant like like oh what the you know like without any actual backing behind it right so i you know i looked into it and what i saw was that they're they had the wrong selection criteria up front the selection criteria naturally excluded not only women but people of color because i think there were only like five minority founders on the whole list as well so that's that's crazy so that's like the level that we're getting to here with what you're saying and what you're trying to take on with mom hive and and i have to believe that there's expansion plans beyond just one location in grand rapids right so it's 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 that kind of thing right it's right that's and that's not that i can't just like standing on your soapbox doesn't always sell memberships, right? Like, yeah. it's not always the most friendly <laughs> thing to be like. Yeah, people are like, what the hell? I just want a place to work. <laughs> right. And, and, I, and I also want to be like, come into this beautiful space that we've created. You know, come have happy hour with us. Come play with your kids. Like, be surrounded by all of these ambitious moms. It's a really fantastic place to work. Like, that's what I'm selling. Mm-hmm. That's the product that I'm selling. But socially, we're, you know, we're accomplishing something. Um, something parallel but bigger yeah okay so so you know we talk about this is an episode about balancing the message with the mission as we've defined thus far the message today is place to work if you're a working mom without the distractions of home life and be able to drop your kid off as well absolutely the larger mission we just identified is about equality fixing the pay gap getting more women in the workforce and keeping them in the workforce and not having to off-ramp so coming back to what I started to ask earlier, which is in your media interviews, is that where you're starting to touch on these things or are you just keeping hands off? Like, I guess, like is this podcast like the first reveal of the larger mission? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yes and no, right? Yeah. Like I think this is probably one of the most um, like tuned in conversations where you get it and, and we want people to start getting it. Yeah. Um, there are organizations that we're aligned with nationally who are, who are tackling this um, from a training perspective, from job placement perspective, 
right? Like um, in local media, the biggest push right now and probably for the first two years is just to let people know that we're here. Yeah. Right? Like it, they just need to even, co-working is not a common term yet. Right. So there's a, there's an educational hurdle about like, what is this space? Like when you walk in, what, what are we, what do I do here? <laughs> like who, who needs to know about us? Um, just to be part of the community. The places that we are having the conversation about the bigger mission are with audiences like leadership at the chamber of commerce. Um, and with leaders of local corporations. So our next phase of growth looks like creating memberships for local companies that they can use strategically to retain and recruit top level female leadership. So it sounds like that level or at that stage is where the, the mission starts to become more of the conversation than just we it have does. physical space because they could go anywhere because technically. Yeah, we yeah, and the physical space need is an acute need for my solo, um, you know, my solo self pay members, yeah. and we will always serve them because they create the community, uh, and they need us. There isn't anything else. At, at that next level, though, this becomes a, a strategic recruitment and retention tool for corporations because if they're not keeping their female talent through parenthood and they don't look appealing to women who are considering having a family moving into West Michigan, they're going to be missing out and they won't be able to keep up with other employers who are being innovative and supporting family. So I think I've got this sort of mapped out in like almost a step one through step four but before I share that, I actually want to just take a sidebar here and let our listeners know about my favorite partner of the show, which is Sales Hacker. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know the topics tend to slant more B2B, but really we're, at the end of the day, we're talking about growth. And a big part of growth is sales, obviously. Sales Hacker is the world's smartest community for forward-thinking B2B professionals. If you didn't know, it's 135,000 members strong. So whether you're a CEO, a head of sales, sales rep, account executive, SDR, Sales Hacker helps you get better at your job, period, with podcasts, articles, webinars, and research from actual sales experts and practitioners, including yours truly. There's no fluff from outside content marketers or people just trying to get your email address. It's the straight dope to grow your sales acumen. I'm a huge fan of what they're doing, and I'm so excited to have them as a partner of this podcast. Now, you can join the Sales Hacker community for free at saleshacker.com. Again, you can join Sales Hacker's community for free, and you'll get access to all those articles, the research, and more at www.saleshacker.com. Today, we are with Alyssa Cairns, the founder, co-founder and CEO of MomHive, and we're talking about how to balance your message with your mission. So Alyssa, as you kind of talked through those stages there or, or the, the different efforts you've taken, here's what I've compiled as a step one to step four-ish, but you let me know if this is off base or if this needs tweaking. <laughs> Sounds like, so if you have a mission behind what you're doing, step one is to just educate people on the right now immediate need that they have. Don't necessarily worry about getting on the soapbox and beating them over the head with like what this is going to mean 20 years from now. Just speak to their immediate need. Step two is after you've spoken to their immediate need, obviously you have some type of sales conversion lever to get them in and experience what, that, what the solution is for the immediate need. In your case, it is the co-working space, all moms, all female with childcare. Step three is when you start to make that shift that is more mission-based, but more than anything, it sounds like it's happening at a partnership level, not necessarily an individual one-to-one -one level. It is partners, like you said, Chamber of Commerce, who are already galvanizing around this or similar issues, yeah? Yeah, like, yes. So looking for those channels who are already 
um, having these conversations about the future of work or depending whatever your industry is, right? Like the bigger picture of, sure. of what future growth looks like. Well, and, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the beauty of that is you find the other entities who are having this, who are almost leaders in this conversation already, or at least participants in the conversation already of the larger mission. And what they are looking for almost always is, well, we're, we're, we're beating this drum, but we need, to, we need to give people actual resources. So those who are aligned with that mission, who hear that, then they say, oh, and there's a specific, in your case, there's a specific place I can go to to help become, to help become part of that mission. And, and hey, guess what? It solves the immediate thing I'm already thinking about anyways. Right, right. So for us, like, um, you know, we're talking about, so employers, let's face it, they're not going to do something out of the goodness of their heart. Like maybe they do, but it's usually to accomplish something (laughs) in capitalism, right? Like (laughs) it's usually to say like, oh yeah, we're, we're a B Corp. People will spend money with us because we're dedicating this wing of our business to support nonprofit or, you know, it's buy one, give one it's still, there's still a gimmick there, right? Like there's still a there's reason. There's still a buy one. It's not just There's still one. a buy one. Like they're, <laughs> they're, you know, they're, they're playing to the sympathies of their, um, of their audience, but like at the heart of it, it's still business. And so, you know, what we're saying is, you know, we're mission driven, um, but we're actually a service provider and we want to be that third party service that helps those bigger companies be competitive. So, by, you know, by us creating this support for parents. And, and like, let me clarify, like, why would a local company buy memberships with me, right? It's to give flex days. It's to give their employees a way to work remotely and not have to take PTO mm-hmm. or sick day. Um, it's a way to give women the ability to balance the demands of being a parent and working, right? Like, my little girl has a presentation at two o'clock today. If I worked in an office, it'd be really hard to get there. But if I could take a remote day, knock out some work in the morning, go to her presentation, go back to my co-working space, log back into, you know, my Slack channel, I'm accountable for the whole day, even though I didn't have to commute to my office. Right. Um, and then even the, um, you know, FMLA period of time that, caregivers have to balance, right? You either have to balance um, coming off of maternity leave. Sometimes you have to balance chronic sicknesses in family members. Sometimes you have to balance caring for elderly family members. So anytime an employee is, is coming off of or balancing FMLA leave, we provide a professional space for them with onsite childcare for them to like re-enter the workforce or to stay relevant in the workforce, even though they're not working full time in their main, you know, their main headquarters office. Right. Right. And that's not a resource that I, that the employer is going to provide on their own. But, but with a employer sponsored membership here, they can divvy those days out to their workforce and provide a support service that they can't afford to do in house. Um, And I said, I think it says a lot about, you know, the way they value their employees. So that's our sell to them is like be a competitive employer. Like, right. When women are moving in to West Michigan, they have choices. And if you're not providing family friendly policies and and perks, then go somewhere else. Well, the interesting thing about that is it still comes down to, I mean, it may be more mission focused ultimately, but selling in still the B2B comes down, realm, right? It still comes down to what's the core need the company has. Right. right? And the company <laughs> needs to retain talent. And like the data shows that the more women you have, the more balance of gender you have in your leadership positions, the more money your business makes. Yeah. Like this yeah. is a feel good thing. Like it makes you more money to keep women in your organization. So like you got to figure out how to deal with maternity leave. Sorry. <laughs> like, sorry, not sorry. Let us help you. That's, that's what, um, well, you know, I've seen 
I've come across a lot of companies who are mission driven, but they are so wrapped up in the mission. They cannot get anything done day to day. And you're, you know, you see them five, six months later, a year later, and they're stuck in the same place. Um, you know, I remember one particular founder I was talking to four years ago in my head, I was like, there's no chance this will last a year if they ever get off the ground. Oh no. <laughs> because I knew from talking to them, they could not get past the 10,000 foot description of what they're trying to accomplish. And every time I was yeah. like, what are you doing today? Or how are you going to get customer adoption today? Or how are you going to take on the biggest competitor in the market? And their answer was always like, well, when they hear about our mission, they love us. I'm like, but love don't pay the bills. <laughs> love right, don't you put money in your account. And so I think like, you know, we talk about what audience we're serving, right? And I always come back to like, what's the acute pain point? Mm -hmm. Like, what's the give me, like, take my money trigger? And for my work at home moms who have kids climbing all over them and piles of laundry, and they just want to write a welcome email to their client list and they can't get it done. Yeah. That's a very acute pain point, right? And she's right. like, take my money. When we go bigger to the corporate level, it's if you don't have female leadership on your technical team, on your leadership team, in your HR, if you don't have equal representation in your employees, you're gonna fall behind, right? And so for them at a strategic level, that's an acute pain point. And supporting mothers in organizations is coming up. Forbes is writing about it, right? Like it's, it's in the conversation if you're listening. And so that, that acute like take my money moment there is like, we did it for you. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, and it's probably way more affordable than you thought it was going to be. Yeah. So I think what I'm kind of gathering out of this is, and as I totally agree with, is you always want to focus on the immediate pain point that can be solved for the customer you're selling to. But then kind of in the background, what you're doing is building this larger like mission through those, through those like backend partnerships to where you get to a point where that has been built up enough that now there's recognition for your brand around that cause. And then because it's enough recognition, there's just enough social proof to where people are like, oh, I want to rally behind that too, as opposed to being like, I'm the first person who's going to rally behind that while no one else is with me. Right. Well, right. And so, you know, that's what I said. Like, I try not to get on the scope box too often. Yeah. Right. Like, um, I, choose who we talk about that bigger mission because it can be very polarizing right like um i think if you get too extreme you're automatically alienating potential clients and customers um and and we've had to prove that it's valuable right like some of those stats you shared at the beginning i didn't have those when this was just an idea sure. and so like um, our MVP, right? Like our minimally viable product was like creating a space, getting people to join and showing that having childcare here enabled a whole new thing to happen. Yeah. And I, and I can say with almost hundred percent certainty that if you had not launched this yet and your first message to potential customers was, Hey, want to solve the wage gap by a coworking membership? <laughs> They'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? I know. I know. <laughs> And that's why, that's like why I can't get it on the soapbox because then I have to backtrack and explain so much about what right. we're doing and what's happening here and like, like paint so many case studies that you're like, okay, no, hold on. Like, it's actually just a beautiful space and it's an amazing <laughs> community and it's worth having an office membership subscription. Mm -hmm. Right. And then once it's proven, then I can bring in the president of local organizations to say like, look what it's doing for freelancers. Can you imagine what this would do to the moms in your workforce? Right? Like knowing that they aren't SOL on the day that their nanny calls in sick, right? Like having them feel supported and that they're not going to have to waste all their personal and PTO days because they're the one available to take their kids to the doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, so uh, um, you know, we proved it minimally with, with one population and then, um, 
it's, it's not too much of a leap to apply it to a much larger um, population of professionals. With that, let's begin our show wrap up. So where can our listeners find MomHive? Where can they learn more about you and get in touch? Yeah, we are at www.momhivegr.com. And that's GR our is for Grand Rapids, right? It is for Grand Rapids. MomHiveGR.com and then at MomHiveGR? Yes. Great. Now, to close out here, we will each give our top one or two lessons or takeaways for the audience based on the discussion today. I'll go first, then I'll hand it over to you. So the topic today was balancing your message with your mission. It's funny because like my handwriting is sometimes chicken scratch. So I, I almost <laughs> read it as balancing your massage. But <laughs> balancing your message with your mission. Uh, to me, I think the biggest thing I got out of this discussion was, was, which was reinforced in the best way possible, is don't get so wrapped up in the mission that it scares people away on day one. Like have something they can latch onto that's tangible and real at the start um, that works within the, the structure that they're used to. Even, you know, I did an analysis earlier this year of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And there's even a part in that where he says, to accomplish this, we cannot look at the white man as an enemy. We must embrace them. We must not, you know, we must forgive them, all that stuff. Which like, he's basically saying, hey, if we want change, we got to at least partially work within the system to get what we want. Um, Alyssa, your top one or two takeaways from our discussion today, which is balancing your message with your mission. Um, I think the, you know, that takeaway is that um, being motivated by your mission is really important, but be patient and be focused when you're proving what it is that you're creating. Um, you know, it's like, I don't know. I, I had someone compare it to like, say you invented a new type of baking flour, right? And you were just trying to sell the flour, but it'd be easier to sell a pound of flour if you made it into cupcakes, <laughs> right? So like yeah. you have a thing that you're, that, you know, that you're creating that maybe doesn't exist yet. Um, but it's still got to be cute and taste good <laughs> to sell it. <laughs> um, and so I, I, you know, I think we're kind of um, a very, uh, you know, just a new example of that or um, just getting our feet under us. But, um, you know, we've proven that like our cupcakes are worth buying and now we get to, to go out and, um, you know, and expand that market to, to the bigger picture. Well, that's, that's a hell of a takeaway that I think we will all apply. Make sure what you're selling is cute and tastes good. I love that. All right. So to close out then my final question, which is what I ask every guest, fill in the blank. Entrepreneurship is blank. Entrepreneurship is a lifestyle. A lifestyle. Yep. Um, being an entrepreneur literally like is the lens on every minute of my day. It is the lesson and the example that I'm setting for my kids. It is the reason I have flexibility to spend time with family and friends. And um, it's also the reason you make sacrifices for some of those things, those, those creature comforts, because you're committed to creating something bigger. Entrepreneurship is a lifestyle. She is Alyssa Cairns, CEO of MomHive. Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us today on Startup Hype Man, the podcast. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. That wraps up today's conversation. Did you like what you heard? Startup Hype Man, the podcast is available on every major platform, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and more. So be sure to subscribe on your platform of choice and leave a rating and review. Do you want to be an upcoming guest on the show? Email media at startuphypeman.com with your idea and my team will review. Our theme song is Change the Game by Jay-Z, all rights owned by Rockefeller and Def Jam Records. And hey, if you want to work together on making your startup story the only one that matters, email me at rajiv at startuphypeman.com. That's R-A-J-I-V at startuphypeman.com. 
Well, that'll do it for today. Thank you for listening. Thank you to today's guest for joining. You have been checking out Startup Hype Man, the podcast. I'll catch you next week. But in the meantime, word up, raise up.